I am going to declare it to be two. And thank you all for choosing me for your uh, post-lunch, hopefully not nap. Uh, this talk started as uh, I swim every morning, and I, and I think about things while I'm swimming. And I started thinking about this, and I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I tried to decide if it was a talk or not. And I couldn't, I couldn't submit it anywhere until I wrote the whole talk because I wasn't sure if it was a talk or not. And uh, you'll be happy to know I have decided it is a talk. And, uh, and so you get to, uh, to ruminate with me on the meaning in C++ of nothing. Uh, I want to cover some ground that you may have heard from me before in some of my other talks, but I think it sets the context for what we're talking about, so I want to talk about it again. And that is the idea of who you write your code for. So you know, we, we have to write for the compiler. Like, if we don't, then it won't compile. But the compiler does not care what names you choose for your variables. The compiler does not care how long your functions are. The compiler doesn't care about a ton of stuff that humans, of course, care a lot. Now, when I'm uh, writing, I don't, I don't do as I was taught. In 1977, I was taught how to write uh, flowchart diagrams, you know, with, diagram, with diamonds and squares and arrows and things. And uh, astonishingly enough, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I make it all up in the text editor, and so I'm talking to myself. So I'm like, so we're going to need the total price, and then I have to get the tax rate from somewhere, and then the total after taxes. And so my variable names are as much about thinking aloud as they are about anything else. But that comes in handy when you try to figure out later why it's not working. So now we're definitely writing for our future selves. And the nice thing about your future self is that you have a good idea of the background knowledge that they bring to reading the code. Although I think we always overestimate our own memory, do we not? You come back later and you're like, what? What? But there's also, like it or not, complete strangers who will be reading your code later. You know that saying about pretend your code's going to be maintained by a violent psychopath who knows where you live? <laughs> Somebody on Twitter last year introduced me, pretend your code is going to be maintained by your grown children. And that's, that's a little even scarier, right? <laughs> and I have written code that's been maintained by my own children, so um, I'd like to write with that in mind. You see, when you're writing code, you are communicating with the future. And that's kind of great and terrifying at the same time. And especially given that we don't know who it is that we're trying to leave notes for, that we're trying to leave trail markers so they know which way to go and that they're not lost and that it's going to be okay. So, oh sure, my code compiles. That, that's not the bar we're trying to meet. It's not enough that your code works. Yes, you have to do these things, but it has to be understandable by other human beings. And that's something that I've been spending a lot of time on, and so I think about what your code says to humans that it doesn't necessarily say to the compiler. And that follows that when you're reading code, you should be able to read between the lines and understand it and catch those messages and those trail markers that the past is sending to you. You know when you're like, what? Uh, what? And, th and then why? <laughs> I don't, I don't, and then of course my favorite, does this really work, right? Like, does it, are you sure? Have you tested it? Because I don't even see how it could. And, and then when the moment when you have to know who it was, and then it was you, that's, that's the worst moment, right? <laughs> so, I often read code and I imagine that that person didn't think of a bunch of things. Now, when I'm reading code from 1998, it's not surprising that they didn't think of using string here or that they didn't use something from the algorithm header. It's really not surprising that there's no lambdas in their code, right? Uh, but sometimes I'll read something from six months ago and I'll say, why did this person do this? What did they not think of? And that's an intriguing question to ponder. How can you put something in your code to tell people what you thought of? So in my mind, well-written code has considered those questions. Does this work? How does this work? What the heck? Why? 
and answers them, but not like this, right? Here's what it does. <laughs> here's, here's who wrote it. And of course, the famous last modified comment, that's super important, right? We've got to know that. No, not like that. By being expressive, right? By being transparent. There's no opacity, nothing's hidden. You can see what's going on and why it's going on. And by being communicative. Well, that brings me to Roger's favorite code snippet. He's waving from the front. We didn't set this up, right? Have you seen this? It's amazing. This is the best code snippet ever. I cannot beat this code snippet for uh, its overall awesomeness. Remember Kevlin's instruction to Dear Max last night. Uh, I can't beat it for awesomeness, but I can beat it for length because the code snippet I want to talk to you about is this. <laughs> this is C++, man. Think about the places where you don't say any punctuation, any keyword, and yet there's meaning in there. Now, sometimes nothing means nothing. There's a class called holder. It holds a number, which is an integer. I could have made it a template, but I'm not. It's got a constructor. It's got another constructor. It's got business logic called ink for increment that increments the number. Well, transparent, that's good. It's got get number, and it's got a two string. Okay, boring. Now look at this version. Let me do this a couple times. Oh, right, so before, the one argument constructor could be used implicitly. Some function that took a holder would be happy enough to take an integer, the compiler would do it for you. Now, we're saying differently. Get number and two string are const. Again, we probably knew that about get number, and we probably guessed that about two string from their name, but now it's being enforced. Two string is virtual. Oh, the others aren't. I mean, they weren't before, but now it's somehow more obvious. And this nothing is exactly what I want to talk about. The nothing that means I'm not virtual. The nothing that means I'm not explicit, I'm not const. That's our default in a lot of cases. Newbies especially don't always read it there. Think about someone who comes to C++ from Java, or all functions are virtual, and doesn't read the absence of the word virtual on these functions. Now, we have lots of opposites in C++. Right? Plus and minus, times and divide, dereference and address of, and so on, brackets, etc. But most things do not have an opposite at all. They don't have them, and they don't need them. Right? What's the opposite of break in a for loop, or, with, or continue in a for loop? <laughs> Fix. <laughs> What's the opposite of calling update balance? Like stale balance? I don't know. There's no opposite of a while or a switch, and that's okay. The trick is the things whose opposite is nothing. So I mentioned virtual already, and override, which is optional, um, but in some cases it matters whether you say it or not. Explicit, whose opposite is nothing. People argue about const, like mutable is the opposite of const. It's like, uh, no, no, like putting mutable somewhere else can pair up with putting const here, but certainly not in all of the places that you can put the keyword const do you put the keyword mutable to mean the opposite. You put nothing at all to mean the opposite. And then, of course, if you're writing a lambda, <laughs> mutable the opposite you get from nothing. When you start out a struct, if you start out by saying private, that's the opposite of if you start out by saying nothing. When you write a class, if you start out by saying, no, I got the backwards, right? The struct is public, so uh, saying public is the opposite, and private is the opposite of nothing, and class uh, private is the opposite. Which way around you do it, if you just say struct, point x, point y, we know what that means. If you say class, point x, point y, we know what that means. And then there is the uh, ref qualifiers and the, and the const qualifiers out on the end of the function. The opposite of them is not saying it. What's your favorite, Marshall? Yeah, uh, 
We have no except at false. So you, have, you don't have to say nothing. You can say no except at false. Yeah. Or, you or you could say nothing, yes. And then I want to talk about three particular attributes because unlike these guys, they don't really affect the way your program behaves. They affect your compiler warnings. So we'll start with fall through. Here we have a switch, switching on some presumably integer since it starts with I and we're all still writing Fortran. <laughs> and this is a super common thing to do, right? If it's one or if it's two, uh, we'll do this thing and then we'll break. If it's three, we'll do this thing and it's sort of telegraphed by the error message content. We fall through to case four and it'll end up printing out case three or case four uh, for the case of three. This is okay in that it will compile and it'll run and it'll work and it's probably in this case not a bug, right? You can tell by the way the messages are written it's supposed to do this. But many, many humans see a break that isn't there. They just assume that case three does only the case three line and then carries on about its business. And some compilers will warn you the same as they'll warn you that you don't have a default, or they'll warn you that, hey, you're switching on an enum, but you don't have a case for every possible value of the enum. So between humans who are misinterpreting what you're saying and compilers who are annoyingly warning you, what are you going to do about it? Well, we can't actually leave a giant blue arrow in our source code, so we try to do the equivalent by, say, a comment. Bjarne says of comments, the compiler doesn't read comments and neither do I. <laughs> And uh, certainly, I don't want the compiler to read comments, so this isn't going to suppress the message. And of course, comments can and do get stale. So you could end up putting a break in here 10 years later and not remove the comment. And if you think that wouldn't happen, you have had a luckier life than me. So for C++17, we gain this attribute fall through. It's kind of like a comment in that it has really no impact on your code at all, but it tells the compiler what you're doing. And I tested because I'm this kind of a person. And if you say fall through and then have a break, you get a warning. So that's good. So you can't get stale. And uh, if you don't say fall through and your compiler has got the ability and willingness to give you warnings that you fell through without your break, then uh, this will suppress the message. You leave it out, you'll get the message. So that's good. So the nothing is legal. Just fall through to the next one. But it's not normal. It's fine for case one and case two, right? That that's, there's no code in between. We all are fine with that. It's where there's code in between that it's weird, and that's what the attribute helps with. So let's take this one. We have some function j, sorry, some function with side effects. We put the value into j. Why? Because I want to do an assert. There's tons of things like this, like, you know, who checks the return value from printf, let's say, right? Um, Plenty of times where functions will give you back a number that really doesn't matter, but maybe in debug, we would like to make sure that it's positive. But in release, we're going to save the, the exhausting cost of that if and, uh, and not test. Fine. When you compile your release build with warnings as errors because you are a good person, you are going to have a problem right? Because it's an unused local variable. You put a value into J and then you never used it because the assert that looks at it has fallen away. So you could uh, suppress the warning with a pragma. That's not great. Uh, you could put in one of those annoying macros. Uh, there's, there, I think it might even be called maybe unused that just touches the variable enough to make the compiler happy, but confuses everyone else who doesn't know why you're using this macro in the middle of nowhere. You could build an if def. Right, so that in release you just called function with side effects and didn't put the value anywhere, and in debug you, you got the value. That kind of stuff, you know what, it drifts over time. Function with side effects, you know, gains a parameter and somebody only puts it in the debug half, and well, you know the deal. So you could put this attribute, maybe unused, on J. And that basically says to the compiler, I might use it and I might not. Live with it. And like all uh, compiler directives, it consists of asserting that you know what you're doing, right? That's all a C-style cast is, like, it's my foot. <laughs> but now, uh, if I'm using it uh, because we're in a debug build and the assert is there, life is good. And if I'm not using it because the assert has gone away, life is still good. 
And it's a, a way also of telling the people who follow you that you're not stupid. Think about those variables you use when you're debugging. You know, some temporary result, you create a variable to keep it in, and then later you're like, I'm just gonna leave that line there because that was a complicated expression. Maybe you comment it out, but I bet you don't. Uh, but by marking it maybe unused, you're indicating that again, it's not an error, it's not an oversight. You're deliberately keeping this variable around because it has some value, not in the execution of a release build, but in what you do while you're debugging or even just exploring the code. Now let's talk about the opposite. Speaking of not testing the return value of printf, I have a function called getNumber. Gives you the only canonical number that's allowed to be used in any code example. And obviously I can call it and put the result into an integer, or I can just call it. This is allowed, it's fairly pointless since there are no side effects in getNumber, but it is legal. Is it wise? Probably not. So if I annotate get numbers return with a no discard, now I will get a compiler warning if I try to call it without putting it into something. Depends on your compiler, but something like you're discarding the return value of a function with a no discard attribute. So it's sort of a please warn me, but it's not really please warn me, right? It's please warn those idiots who call this function, <laughs> which is still, to be fair, probably me. These are about telling the compiler what you mean, but they have this wonderful side effect of telling human beings what you mean. I am falling through on purpose. I wrote a seemingly useless member or local variable for a reason, and I'm giving you a return value for a reason, please use it. And that's really what I want to maybe change how some of you write code to say, can you explain your wishes to the future who's reading that code? So defaults, ignore them. Rather than trying to memorize what all the defaults are, rather than requiring everyone who might read your code to know the defaults, spell it out. So say public, say private, say no except that false, say whatever the default is, where there is one, uh, where that can be expressed with a keyword. So you don't have to put override on your overrides, but if you do, well, people don't have to go and look to see if this is an override or not. You've told them. Use no except a false. Tell people, I thought about this. That's all. My experience is that when the future guesses about us, they do not do so in a generous and optimistic way. <laughs> I've guessed about a lot of past people, including past me, and I don't give the past very much credit for planning and for knowing and for choosing on purpose. So if your code says, I chose this on purpose, Right? then people cannot assume blindly that they're smarter than you and fix it for you because you've made it very clear that actually this was your intention. Now, that works for public and private, for no accept and no accept false, but not for everything. Right? We do not have implicit, although I kind of wish I did. We do not have const at false, we do not have non-virtual, and are there any VB people? We do not have by val. Because another place that nothing shows up is passing parameters, and I've got some examples on that. So how can you express something that can only be expressed by typing nothing in a way that causes people to know what it means? Not like this. <laughs> This isn't much better. Like, why are you passing it by value? Why, why is it important for everyone who reads the code to know that this parameter is passed by value and a copy is made? If you're standing there knowing, your fingers are on the keyboard and you're typing a comment, don't stop with the what, carry on to the why. Because here's the thing. 
When you don't mark a member function const, or when you don't mark a function no except, and especially when you don't mark a function no except, is it because you deliberately reasoned the whole thing through and you know for sure that that keyword does not apply here? Or is it that you never thought about it? I walked up to a million line code base and I thought it would be intriguing, I knew how big it was, to get a measure of how many consts there were. You know, like is it 10%, 5%, 6%? No, 6 total. Zero total. <laughs> Zero total. I'm like, did I grep wrong? Let me, no, I did not. Oh my gosh, zero. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> so you will find places where const has been left off because the person who wrote the function just didn't give it a thought. That's sad. You will definitely find places where no except has been left off. But how can someone who's reading your code know that you left const off of here on purpose. Now, if your function is called set temperature, I think we're all, we're all good with that, or update shipping times. But you know, that's not what they're usually called. They're usually called process something or next something or what have you, and it's not clear uh, whether or not it should have that. One way is to look at the rest of the code. And if I find zero consts, then any particular missing const tells me nothing. Mm -hmm. But if I find const sprinkled everywhere, then when it's not there, it says something. So that context that you set up puts weight onto your uh, silences, onto your absence of keywords. I would rather not put in a comment that says something like, I'm not marking this no except because it sometimes throws an exception. Like, I, yes, that's what it means. Uh, but if something's going to be tricky, so that someone would say, oh, you forgot to put override on here, then you might want to say, hey, I know this looks like it's an override, but reasons. So let's get specific. Here's a function. I, I don't like uh, aggressively non-names, so I made up nonsense names. Uh, thimble here takes an integer robot, and it increments it. And then if that made it convert to true, we're done. Otherwise, it decrements it. OK, imagine something more interesting. Uh, imagine especially something with side effects, right? It's writing to the database or whatever, but I got to fit on the slide. But here's the thing. Right here, we return. Because that's what you do at the bottom of a void function if you don't say return. You fall out the bottom. Now look at Spryl here, which takes oob and boo. It increments oob, and then we go into a while true, and it continues to increment oob until it manages to get bigger than boo, at which point we return. And again, there's no side effects, so that's not very helpful, but maybe we were writing to a log or clearing a queue or processing messages or something, right? And down here at the bottom of Spryl, we do not return. The only way out of this function is when oob finally manages to get bigger than boo. And that distance is not obvious. They look kind of the same at the ends. They both just end with brace brackets. I like this better. It's clear here that we fall out of the bottom. Well, we're not falling, right? We're deliberately returning. But it's made clear. And that means that the absence of a return statement in Spryl becomes something to notice. Hey, wait, what? We don't return at the bottom? Where, where do we return? What's going on? Oh, I see, in the middle of the while. That's the only way out. By being verbose, you are being clearer. I feel. I'm a big ranged four fan. Love me a ranged four meet a lot of people who don't. But I'm going through all the employees in the department and I'm doing something with them. What have we learned? Let's try this one. Oh, now, the, now I'm going through all the employees in the department by reference. Right, those were copies before. Or maybe they're const references. And suddenly this all carries meaning. 
right? If it's not a const reference, that middle loop must change them. Maybe we're giving everyone a raise. But the bottom loop, maybe it's just going to print their pay stubs or something. So suddenly there's information. It's, it, yeah, I care about the perf of making the copy into emp every time that matters. Or, and in fact, it would be worse if they were non-copyable for whatever reason. But again, setting aside the compiler, setting aside the runtime behavior, there's a lot of information in emptiness, ampersand, const ampersand. Parameters in general. What do you think about this function? These are words. This isn't Thimble and Sprile. I'm creating an order, giving it a customer and an order item. Who thinks that's right? Very few hands. It's smart because it's the top of the slide, right? <laughs> Here now we're going to take the customer by reference. Aha, we can change the customer, right? So we customer can have a list of all its orders or something. That makes sense. Why is the order item being taken by value? Well, it could be that, that clever optimization thing about how you take it by value and then you move it, and that's better than taking it by reference. Could be that. Maybe this is a really smart person. Now, now we're going to take the customer by const reference. Well, now I know you're trying to save a copy on customer, but now I, what, customers don't know their orders? And I'm actually going to conclude different things about these functions before I, before I even read them, just from their declarations. For the one that takes the non-const customer reference, I expect that in the happy path where we successfully created an order that we are going to return, that the last line will add that order to some list in the customer. But for the const ref one, I expect that it will not do so, and that whoever calls it, because they're getting an order back, will add that order or a pointer to it or whatever to some listing customer. So I'm seeing different like implied contract behavior right away. That's a lot of weight for a single character or the absence of a single character to carry. And especially the, the thing with the, oh, maybe you're going to do a by value then move. Like how do, you, how do you get nothing to say, I'm moving this later and this is more efficient and see this paper or talk or what have you. Uh, these are the places where you might say, I'm going to put a comment in here that says I know what I'm doing. But again, don't literally say, I know what I'm doing. Uh, explain why it is that you're doing it this way. You know that you can declare a function without giving names to any of the parameters. That's another kind of nothing. So I can have determine total taxes at int, int, int. Super, no one's going to get this wrong. It's going to be great. It's going to work so well. The compiler is happy, but humans are not happy, so don't do this. But it's a lesser known fact that you can also do this in the definition. Well, no, not if you use it, obviously, but sometimes you don't use it. Right? I, I've worked in a lot of, for example, visual frameworks where you have to implement an event handler for when someone clicks on something. And uh, you get two parameters. One of them is a way to find out exactly what got clicked on. And the other is like the x, y coordinates of the click, that kind of thing. And if I'm writing a button handler, I do not care where on the button you clicked. So I don't look at that parameter. There's also, of course, API drift. I spend a lot of time in a lot of really old code bases. And there's some third parameter that we took away in 1802 but because the API is published, you know, we're never going to use it. And sometimes these parameters get names like unused and obsolete and dummy and doesn't matter. That's not the best really way to annotate them. Well, if you leave the name out when you define the function, you will not get warnings that the parameter is unused, which is better than the macro thing again. And when someone goes to read this function, they understand right from the beginning. Whatever's happening in that comment that says whatever, it doesn't involve the third parameter. It can't involve the third parameter because the third parameter doesn't have a name. So you know right away when you first look at that first line of the definition what's happening. Well, that's great, but couldn't we do that when we declared it? So this is now what I do when I'm declaring functions like that. Just don't give it a name. The compiler couldn't care less. But the humans who read it understand that that's also what I'm doing in the definition. 
And then that carries information. And right away they know the absence of a variable name there tells them, in fact, the function doesn't use it. Now, it's not a completely reliable signal because it could be nameless here and have a name when you implemented it, right? You could be lying. Please don't lie. Um, but this is a good way to tell people. And because so many IDEs will give people little tooltip helps with the parameter names, they'll get that help right while they're calling it. Though I don't care what you pass for the last number, I don't use it. Then that got me thinking. There's a lot of nothing that says volumes. Can I also shoehorn in you know, some other things that speak volumes? What does it mean to use a pointer? We're not supposed to, quote unquote, use pointers anymore. Although the number of people who misinterpret that a great deal. We're not supposed to have raw owning pointers. Doesn't mean we're not supposed to have raw pointers. So if I have this function that sends emails and it takes an employee pointer, how many people would be surprised if at the end of it, send emails deleted that pointer? <laughs> I would be surprised, right? But that's just kind of from its name, you know? It doesn't really mean anything. But what if it returned a message pointer? Would you expect that it would be your job to delete that message, that it's carefully made for you? Or is there some giant message store somewhere and you just have like an observer pointer into there and leave it alone, other people are managing its lifetime? Like, oh, it's harder to know, right? So you're the consultant, you've just been brought in, this code base is a zillion years old, and uh, you're supposed to understand this, and you're wondering if the reason they have a memory leak is because no one's deleting this message, or if the reason they have memory corruption is that people are deleting messages when they're not supposed to. And so this is your, your burning question. Is that raw pointer owning or non-owning? You're not going to grep for it throughout the code base, but how can you kind of get a, a hint or a feel? Well, uh, like when I tried to find const and got nothing, are there any unique or shared pointers anywhere? I'll settle for an auto pointer. Uh, is there any sense that memory management is too hard to leave up to people? If so, then that kind of speaks that this was a choice. They could have used a shared pointer, they could have used a unique pointer, and they didn't. So they're probably not trying to tell you to manage its lifetime. I have, it's hard to look for new because there's a lot of variables that are called things like new order and new report and stuff, but you can certainly look for delete. If there's a lot of new and delete sprinkled all throughout the user code, then this is a code base where they are expecting people to manage memory. Are they living in rule of three land? So they've written the destructor, the copy constructor, and the copy assignment operator. And when they've moved up to the rule of five and they're also writing move constructors and move assignment operators, then they are probably expecting some of that behavior from the consumers of the code. But what if there are no destructors at all? <laughs> right? Then they're living in happy rule of zero land. All of their memory is managed by something stack-based, whether that's vector or whether that's a smart pointer. And in that universe, when you give me a raw pointer, it's obviously an observer pointer. I don't need an observer pointer class or, or the, the owner annotation from the, from the guideline support library. You never use raw pointers for anything other than observer pointers, then I know what a raw pointer is when you give it to me. And I'm like, hey, thank you for giving me a way to call member functions on message. That's delightful of you. And I'm done. So the, the actual declaration of the function cannot tell you, but that bigger context, what else do these people know? What else do these people choose to do? I'm so happy when I discover I'm living in rule of zero land. It doesn't happen terribly often. Sometimes I can leave it that way, though. So punctuation. If I'm taking parameters by reference, if I'm taking parameters by address, can that carry meaning? For example, when you pass by address, that's non-const. Right? We don't have that way of saying that. Or if I pass by a non-const reference. Again, is this someone who is telling you, attention, I changed this? Or is it just how they were taught? 
and they don't change it. And it could easily be a const reference. You can't tell until you've read some of the code, but you can write code that tells people things. A lot of style guides used to say, if you take a parameter by address, you take ownership of it. And it's yours to delete when you're done with, and no one will delete it until you do. And when you take it by reference, it belongs to someone else, leave it alone, they will delete it. And I, like the compiler doesn't care that, right? That, that's not a compiler thing. But the humans on the team had shake hands on this. Now, that's not how we do things today. <laughs> but it could. You could meet code where the oldest person on the team laughs at you for trying to manage some memory because, hey, you know, uh, I would have given it to you by address if I wanted you to manage it, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of ways to load extra meaning into these seemingly arbitrary choices. I encourage people who are learning C++ to pass things by reference because there's less punctuation. Simple as that. But in the old days, I could encourage them to pass something by address in order to carry that extra layer of meaning about ownership and lifetime. We talked about range four. What if I write a not ranged four, a good old four int i equals zero loop? Why would I do that? Well, maybe it doesn't touch all the elements. Maybe it breaks early. Maybe it skips some of them with continue. Maybe it's incrementing its own index in the body of the loop, you've seen that, or backing up to go again. I love the case when the minute I see four int i equals, I'm like, something's going on. Spidey sense, here we go. That's usually not the situation. There's usually 10,000 such loops because they were written before ranged four was added to the language. But it's wonderful when, by simply using something we've had since day one, you can actually say, like, Danger Wool Robinson, pay close attention, look what I'm doing, this is a weird loop. And people who can't be bothered to switch their old loops to ranged fours are throwing away that signal. And of course, come on, you know I love the algorithm header. What are you writing a loop for? Buddy, what's happening? Uh, isn't this any of, you know? I mean, I'm not gonna say this is obviously a rotate. <laughs> That's not my line. <laughs> But sometimes it's obviously a rotate, okay? And so if you are an accumulate person, which I know is technically not an algorithm, if you are an any of, all of, none of person, a find, a stable partition, whatever, then when I see you write a loop, again, I'm like, why are you writing a loop? What's going on? This is a person who knows about mismatch, and yet they're writing a loop. What's happening? So. Again, the context that you build up around this one little hunk of code where you say, this is who I am, this is what I normally do, this is me not doing what I normally do. That's a subtle thing to try to deal with, but it's so valuable in huge code bases. And so anytime you have a code base that's got thousands of boring for loops that could be ranged fors or could be algorithm calls, I would say it is worth the time and effort to transform that code so that the few remaining weird loops stand out as weird loops. Uh, I think it was Simon who said initialization is bonkers. It is, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I just want to talk about this weird little corner. You know the best place to initialize a member variable? Right? The, after the colon in the, in the constructor. That was the best advice in 1998 anyway. So what if I go to a constructor and it lists some member variables, but not the others? Someone's missing. Well, as Marshall said, there is actually a better place and that's in your non-static member initializer because then you get the same default value even if you have multiple constructors. So as soon as I see a missing member variable after the colon, that's the first thing I do. Where was the variable declared? Maybe it's initialized there because that's better. If that's not the case, well, maybe it gets set at, in the braces. And that's not always wrong. It's often wrong, so I ask why. Uh, there are people who have been bit by the initialization order being the declaration order, not the order they appear in the list. 
and they move it into the body so they can be sure it'll be last. Um, there are other sometimes good reasons, but there is also forgetting. That's a popular one. And yes, my favorite, you have like five constructors, eight member variables, and we add the ninth member variable. Because the constructors aren't all together in the source file, somebody got forgotten, somebody got lost. And hanging out at the end of the source file is that last constructor who doesn't initialize things. And that's what causes the weird bug that only happens when the person uses the keyboard shortcut and not when they click the button. Yeah. But now I see this a lot more lately. I see it with people who've come from other languages. What does this mean? It's string s equals quote, quote. That is exactly the same as string s semicolon, right? And vector, oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I, I never like to use constructors of any kind with vector. Like it's just like a, an aversion thing because of the whole, you know, aggregate. Because I mostly, I use braces, except for never ever with vector because, again, the aggregate thing. Uh, so here, if I just said vector of employee department semicolon, same thing, right? So then I'm peering at this code. Who are you? What are you trying to tell me? What do I need to know? What's happening? And sometimes it used to say string s equals enter a number, right? And then someone said that prompt is really annoying. You should clear it away. And somebody just cleared away the prompt, leaving the quote, quote. And they didn't stop to think about, hey, I guess I don't need anything here. Same with the vector, maybe we're like, hey, let's pre-initialize to 50 because efficiency. Uh, and then someone else decided that was dumb and they just changed it to zero. But other times I think it comes from the person who's writing the code really not knowing uh, what the default constructor is or does or that default constructors can happen. Because especially if you come from other languages, you never really type just string S. So they feel an obligation to set it to something. And I know I'm a little inconsistent here. I'm prepared to be called out for inconsistency on this one. Because I'm like, say public in your struct. Say private in your class. Say return at the bottom of your void function. And then all of a sudden I'm like, don't say equals quote quote on your string. I don't know, I contain multitudes. I, I don't think that this is a good place to be explicit with your defaults. I think here, letting the default be the default is the choice. But I'm prepared to be disagreed with. Well, let's do a show of hands for these. How many of you would use implicit if it were a thing? Let's get about a third of the room. I think we might be getting explicit at false, which is implicit, right? So that's good news for everyone who said they would do it. How many would use const at false? Because mutable won't, won't mean it there. Less. Really? I, I would use const at false all day long. Same as no except at false. I have thought about it. I didn't forget, I want you to know, this changes. I think it's a really great signal to be able to send. And I think, I think I would, it would be constant false and not mutable, because A, mutable's taken, and B, it opens you up for all that template stuff, you know, constant bool in general. What about non-virtual? Anyone? Very, very few hands for non-virtual. Because we're not polymorphizing as, as much as we once were, are we? Yeah. Uh, by val or something less aggressively visual basic -y. anyone? Very, very, one or two people. That's our default, and it's a good default. It's a, it's a wise and clever default that we can embrace more now than we could five years ago. Passing things by value, value semantics, this is our future. But depending on how much time you spend with people, again, from other languages who don't know that that's our default, sometimes there can be a real cognitive dissonance when that finally gets connected. For now, uh, I, I call it out when I think it's important, and otherwise not. What about our C++ 17 attributes? Who's using any of these? Uh, fall through, no discard, maybe unused? Like a quarter of the room. I apologize to the people who are like right under that light. You people are at the North Pole. I can't tell if your hands are up or not. I'm, I can only see three quarters of you. 
Yeah, okay, so let's do that. Uh, if, if the reason you're not using them is because you're not on 17, let me have some hands too. Oh, so that's another quarter of the room. So probably half of you would use these three if you could. That's good. You know, people have different opinions about the proliferation of attributes. It's all totally optional and it shouldn't hurt anyone except for maybe your compile time. I like being able to tell the future that I did it on purpose, that I know what I'm doing, that I didn't just not consider the possibilities. You know, um, beginners write case statements without breaks because they don't know they need breaks. They think when you hit the next case, that's an, an automatic break. I would be upset if someone thought I was in that category, <laughs> but they may not know that I wrote the code. They may not know who wrote the code, and they may think that it was a different situation. Uh, anyone have a really good reason to not use these arguments besides not being on C++ 17? Okay. There's, of course, there is not knowing they were there, which is fair. Like, it's, they're relatively new. So what do I want you to do? Because this is all like an interesting thought experiment. Like, huh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes we say nothing. That's interesting, and it carries meaning. That's nice. Well, great talk. Okay, I wonder if there's coffee. But I want you to do stuff. I want you to deliberately and on purpose actively communicate in your code. Right? Think about not just making it compile and not just making it calculate the correct value, but about it telling future you or your child what you're doing and why you're doing it. Show them your thoughts. Do not leave them a puzzle. Do not leave them there going, what? What? Or especially not, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Don't let them think poorly of you. Because come on, we have all read old code. What do we think about the people who wrote that code? <laughs> When we realize it's us, we feel bad, right? We are suddenly stricken when we realize that it's us. You can prevent that. Do you have a comment? Yes. When I read old code that I wrote, yes. and, I, and I cringe inside, I'm happy because it means I have gotten better. That is true. If you cringe at your old code, you have gotten better. But is some of your cringing also like, wow, I was very mean to old Marshall? just now, before I realized it was my, myself? Because I've done that. I've done that. What, what complete imbecile was responsible for this? Yeah. I have done that since, like, last week. <laughs> last week. <laughs> <laughs> I castigated one of my coworkers for being an, an idiot. Right. And I said, oh, yeah, that was me. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so you can defend against that. Right? You can put things in the code to tell future you or future whoever, actually, I'm quite smart. I want you to think about what isn't in your code. Think about what isn't on the screen. What you're not doing. Why didn't you use something from algorithm? Why do you have to write a for loop here? Oh my gosh, I remember writing documents about when to use for and when to use while that were entirely and, and only about intent. Be like, use a for loop when you know exactly how many times it's gonna be, and use a while loop when you don't. Like the compiler couldn't care less, right? But the humans reading the code, that code, that choice carries some meaning to them. So I've got two alternatives that are exactly the same, like free function versus member function. If they aren't truly exactly the same, but maybe there's this like meta meaning, this extra layer of meaning by putting that choice into action a certain way. Sometimes when you stop and evaluate five or six ways to do things, because this is C++ and we have five or six ways to do many things, one of them is clearly better than the other. So that in itself is a useful habit. But this is really about a case where you just adopt a convention that carries information to other people by these choices. The best way to teach people what your arbitrary choices mean is to write it down somewhere. So a comment once in a while that says, I don't know, 
don't do this, passing by address because I want you to delete it, uh, no, but the equivalent of that. So that over time, as people get familiar in your code base, they get familiar with your little kind of signals from the past. There are places where we have no choice but to have all of our meaning carried in nothing, where there is no verbose alternative, there really isn't a place to put a comment, the nothing has to carry all the meaning on its own. What you need to do is to show who you are in all the rest of the code. If all the rest of the code, you know, is const correct, uses no except properly, uh, looks really modern, uses templates where they're a good choice, uses lambdas where they're a good choice, then all of a sudden, this function pointer is here for a reason. This multiple inheritance must be here for a reason. This old school for loop must be here for a reason. That's a really hard skill to develop. Victor. Yes, you can't update the whole old code base all at once yes. to send the right signals in your new code. That's true. But it is one of the motivations for updating old code, right? If you've got one of these back and forths with management about whether or not someone should really take the time to like update all our for loops to ranged fours or algorithm calls, you know, this is another plus that you can put on the side of going and doing that. You can say, furthermore, if we do this, we're going to be consistent because all the new code is modern. And the few places where we don't use, say, algorithm, will stand out. Right now, they're drowned in the signal of the old code. And that may tip the balance to being able to do that refactoring. Um, when, you check, uh, when you check the surrounding test, check if that's called to know the test, how far would you go? Would you check the immediate surroundings or the whole code base, given that perhaps several people would participate in the style? So if you're, if you're an employee, you have the luxury of knowing the history. So for an employee who was working internally on a code base they'd been on for like a year, I would tell them, you know, start where you are and then move out to other areas that you know changed recently. But I often land, uh, I often land after the only person who understood the code is gone. Um, in some cases, literally uh, the hit by a bus. And uh, they want me to understand the code. And so it's all the same to me. And so, yeah, I, I'll, I will do things like, is there the letter C-O-N-S-T anywhere in these million lines of code? Uh, it's not my first choice, but sometimes it's what you got. That is correct. If you start from no const to what's going to be const correct in new code, then you've lost the signal in your old code. So that's an interesting situation where maybe the middle of the spectrum isn't as safe, right? If you go all the way over to all our code is const correct, then you're back to the absence carrying a signal. If you leave it alone and pretend you still don't know anything about const, well, I guess you still don't know anything about const. So you don't really gain much. But if you sit in the middle, you kind of lose that signal. And that's true for any kind of partial um, update of legacy code. I usually say only do the hot path, but then you'd have to go back to Jonathan's question and say, make sure that you only look for signal in, say, files that were changed this century, something like that. You know, <laughs> it's a useful filter in your, in your source control, at least it is for me. If you're lucky enough to really own a code base and be able to put your stamp on it, maybe all the code reviews go through you, something like that, then this is where you can like infuse that code base with you. Right? And say, this is who I am. I know that we have a keyword const. <laughs> I, I did a talk, and I talked about the keyword mutable. And, and, and I, have a, I have a kid who lives on the other side of the world and is doing a PhD who is younger than mutable. And people were like, wow, that mutable keyword sounds like it's really going to catch on. And you know, it's like over 25 years old. Um, yet people don't know it's there. And they don't know const is there. And they certainly don't know no except, right? But you can show that you do. You can also show, like, I designed my class as well, I know what encapsulation is, that kind of thing. And then where you're left with no ability to type what you mean, you can still use your nothing very generously. So that the person in the future who's trying to understand what you were thinking, why this actually works, right? How has this been like this for 17 years? I don't understand. They have everything they need to 
understand your nothings as well as your somethings. And that's really the key, to understand where you were, why you wrote it this way, what you're trying to tell them. That's what I want you to do when you say nothing. Thank you. Thank you.